Uh, I'm Jared Gardner, and I'm an assistant professor of pathology and dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. And I'm here today with Dr. Beth Rubin, who is the director of dermatopathology at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and also a professor of dermatology and dermatopathology at the University of California, San Francisco. Beth, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delightful morning. Definitely. <laughs> we uh, wanted to have you here today to talk a little bit about nails. I understand that you have kind of a thing for nails, and I, what I really want to know is how did you develop a, a thing for nails? Because nothing about any nail biopsy I've ever looked at made me think, wow, I really want to do this with my life. So <laughs> tell me your story. Okay. So the story is it's, it's a love-hate relationship, and if yes. anyone who's looked at these specimens will attest to that. So it started off, as many of the things we get interested in uh, do, as an accident. So I was, I'd been a fellow at UCSF doing my Derm Path Fellowship. I, had, uh, I was going to come back to UC Davis, Department of Dermatology, and do dermatopathology there. And so I took a leave of absence. And uh, during the time uh, I was doing my fellowship, a new faculty member joined, Monica Lowry, who's one of just my dearest colleagues and friends. And she had a special interest in nail disease, clinical nail disease. She had done a, a Women's Derm Society uh, mentorship uh, mm -hmm. grant with Eckhart Haneke, who's a very well-known uh, dermatologist, dermatopathologist with an interest in nails. And she came back and she started doing a bunch of surgery. And so where I had seen maybe one nail specimen my whole fellowship, I came back to a flood of nail specimens. Uh. And it was basically a sink or swim type of a thing where I had to just you know, learn learn as I went. And there, at that time, there really wasn't a lot written about nail pathology, mostly just sort of uh, separate articles here and there. And, and you know, I kind of got what I could out of those. And then the other thing, how, uh, how I kind of got... Uh, more knowledge going was to start being involved in the Council for Nail Disorders, which you might know is a, a, a nail society in the U.S. And uh, that was really a big help for me uh, to try to you know, just get get the get my uh, base of knowledge going. And then it just a lot, seeing a lot of cases and. You know, learning from Monica, the clinical side sense. and all that but kind of So thing. when she came, you had someone who had an interest and expertise with nails on the clinical side, right? So that was probably pretty helpful. You weren't just getting little tiny fragments from someone who said, well, it's, there's something wrong. We don't know what it is, right? <laughs> yeah, she, well, she's an expert at, say, at surgery. So I was also very fortunate uh. because I had really good specimens to work with, which as you probably know, and many people who get these specimens know, half the battle is the specimen. That's, well, so I, I can see how my life would have been different maybe if I would have had that experience. <laughs> um, so, so what's some practical advice you can give to those of us out in the trenches that maybe don't work with a nail expert or an ex expert nail surgeon? You know, what, what can we do to help our colleagues who do the surgery to give us the best kind of specimen? Sure. So, well, you know, I, I think, I honestly think, though, that people are getting better training in nail surgery than they did maybe when I was going through my mm -hmm. training. I mean, I, we barely got any. And I think there's just a lot more of an emphasis on it. But uh, basically understanding what the best procedure is for the disease you're trying to diagnose. So um, if you're looking at melanonychia, understanding you know which type of procedure will give you the best result for what kind of lesion you're looking at, where the lesion is. If it's inflammatory, understanding, you know, should I be thinking about doing a longitudinal excision or a punch or something like that. Basically, you have to understand, as we do with all dermatologic specimens, where the, yeah, where the money is, where's, where's, where's the, money, the right? action, sure. okay. And you have to understand in the nail, where is the, where is the action? If, you know, just just looking at the patient, if it's a nail dystrophy, is this um, affecting the proximal matrix, distal matrix, understanding those types of things. Um, and, you know, just talking to your dermatopathologist before you get started. I have a lot of people who just call me up and say, hey, I'm, you know, interested in, in making this diagnosis. What's what's the best way to go that's about great. it? So so that helps a lot. Um, I think that's kind of a general rule, like in Derm Path, I tell my med students, even if they don't go into Derm, you know, but if you want, if you're a family practice in a rural area and you want to know what kind of box, so just call the Derm Path. We'll, we'll help you know, yes, punch or shave or don't mess with this. This is really, this is a serious situation and uh, I can see. So building that rapport is really important mm -hmm. then with your surgeons. Um, okay, that's good. Um, how do you, uh, on the pathology side, how do you handle things? Are there tips for how to gross, how to technically process nails so that you get the best results? I find sometimes it's hard to get the nail to stick, the stain, especially when you want to do an immuno stain. Mm -hmm. If you know, if you have a lot of nail plate on there still, it makes it difficult. So what, what do you guys do in your lab? Clearly you have a lot of experience with them. Sure. So I've, I've done sort of high tech and low tech things. Right now I'm kind of more toward the low tech uh, mm. thing. So number one, 
talk to your gross techs and they, they don't even touch a nail specimen before we it's have a little it's chat. A good rule, good <laughs> yeah. rule. So basically, you know, um, in, in general, if you've got something longitudinal, keep it longitudinal. Mm -hmm. Don't bread loaf it. And there's rare exceptions to that. So if you've got a longitudinal excision, you know, you may even just lying it down on edge, you know, eventually. Mm -hmm. um, for, for submitting specimens, it does start with the clinician. Submit the small or delicate, thin, let's say, matrical shaves on a piece of cardboard or paper to keep them sort of stiff, like we do for the MF sure. biopsy, so they don't curl up, right? And then sure. you can cut them and embed them better. Um, and then uh, for processing, if it's got the nail plate, what we'll usually do is some variation on using um, either a sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, or a, a thioglycolate solution for, you know, a diluted solution for, you know, 15 minutes. 30 minutes before it goes in to be processed and so one of the things we use we have I have used is just Nair over-the-counter Nair yeah, depilatory agent mm -hmm. diluted two to one and then you, you go for that um, but you can buy there's commercial preparations too um, and the, then the other thing is oftentimes when when they're uh, sectioning they'll go ahead and put some more of that on actually on the block, oh, on, the on, block. on the specimen and as they're sectioning just to soften it up in between That's because they do tend to pop out of the block yes, and they got the nail plate sure. as you know and they end up across the gross uh, the, the histology lab um, don't want that to happen no. um, and then in terms of the sticking so you can use things like albumin mm -hmm. it's really helpful on the slide to get it to stick and stay put then the other issue is cover slipping so once you got this thick non-pliable plate under there. Sometimes you get a lot of issues with cover slipping and yeah, air bubbles, so you've got to pay attention to that and try to get that to, to light Cool. Down. Those are great, great practical tips. Um, that's really wonderful. So let's talk about Molana and Nikki. I think this is, the, this is the thing that vexes me the most because I don't know, are they actually getting, you know, are they near the matrix? Are they in the right place? Do I see anything to account for the pigment at all? And I feel, unfortunately, a lot of times I see them from young kids, the hand surgeons, you know, done the biopsy, and they're a very skilled surgeon, but, you know, I don't see anything to account for the pigment, and so I end up doing levels and stains, and, you know, what, do you, what am I supposed <laughs> to be doing differently, Beth? What's I feel wrong? your pain. <laughs> what am I doing I felt wrong? that pain. I feel that pain a lot. Because I hate to have a kid have a biopsy on their nail or anyone, and then me say, well, there's nothing there. I don't know if it's good, or you just missed it, or it's very dissatisfying. It, 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 can, it certainly can be, and sometimes that's all you end up with, but, um, so one of the things that I do, and I, and I do uh, see a lot of cases in consultation too. I don't do anything until I know exactly what the clinical lesion look like. Mm -hmm. A photograph can be wonderful. A photograph can be taken even after the surgery if they oh. just did just a punch and they didn't avulse the nail plate, you can still see the band. Are you able to get photos most of the time ahead I'm, of time? I'm able to get photos quite a bit, especially from people who are, are you know, knowledgeable about mm -hmm. Milan and AK. They really understand like this, this is extremely helpful. So photograph or at least a description. How, how wide was the band? I don't do anything until I just start with some basic clinical information. Um, you know, what color was it? So for example, you're saying, you know, I, I'm not seeing something. Maybe it's melanocytic activation. So mm -hmm. that can be a very light band, tan, yes. gray band, clinically very faint. And that's one of the ones where you really have to work for it. You were uh, on the histology end of things in terms of getting the diagnosis. So in that situation, um, you you know you might want to do levels, but you um, want to do a Fontana stain. You mm -hmm. know, I, I'm not one to do stains just for the heck of it, but Fontana just to show, okay, I can identify some pigment here because normally there's really no well, pigment, yeah. right, in the, nor in the normal matrix to speak of. So Fontana, do immunostains. Uh, my preferred for melanonychia, generally speaking, um, especially in those low density types of cases, would be one of the nuclear markers, so SOX10 yeah, or, that's or what MITF. I've used. Okay, I like those. But if you're and if you're really going for subtle, though, melanate really is the most sensitive. Okay. I've had some failures with both of the nuclear markers in, in nails. For who knows why? Um, could be and a lot of times on outside blocks. So I don't know if there's some sort of yeah. processing situation there. Um, but yeah, you got to work for those. And then levels, yeah, because a lot of times those specimens aren't bisected or they're just laid on edge and you're really not into it yet. But at the same time, you don't want to over level. Right. Because so I usually <laughs> will cut, you know, get some stains, some some stains, and then have them cut down into. To it, and that way I've not got, you know, oh, there's nothing left, and you, know, you never perfect. want to be in that situation, <laughs> yeah, right? Perfect, yeah, you want to reserve a few for some immunos. So what about looking for hemorrhage and hemocytor? I think you actually had mentioned once before that blood actually doesn't stain with the iron stains, right? Right, right. In fact, it's funny, I just just finished a case yesterday before I, before I got on the plane, um, and they had done a lot of iron stains, and, and, and it does not stain hemorrhage. So the uh, typical iron stains that we think about are hemocytorin stains, mm -hmm. so they're, you know, Prussian blue pearls 
cells, and that kind of thing. And so they require hemocytorin to be present. And when you're talking about subungal hemorrhage, it's still hemoglobin. It's just mm -hmm. blood. So it hasn't been converted. So it's not going to stain. And, and so the, the one stain you can do is a modified benzidine stain. And it's, it's basically a DAB. It's part of the oh. DAB reaction. It's pretty simple to adapt. And it basically just colors the, the blood brown <laughs> you well, know you know just like when you have you know yeah when you have let's say rbcs and you haven't completely um, blocked endogenous peroxidase that's what you're basically uh -oh, shooting for okay, on that that's really cool on that stain and so you're just looking for the blood uh, but the thing is you know most of the time you can see it yeah. but if you've got very tiny loculations it'll help with that but a lot of times you know it just gets overlooked you just got a big I, that's the case i was just working on it had a big nail plate with a big loculated um, blood underneath and it had just been overlooked completely as and it was the same thing they had done stains on multiple sections of the block but really it was the blood it's just That's that you tend to just yeah because we're used, to, we're used to thinking oh it's just background and not realizing here it actually matters and right. I mean I think half of the time that's the interesting thing that residents say what about all that blood or you know, punch pipe scene I'm like what oh yeah that because <laughs> yeah. you, you just learn to ignore it and everything else so that's interesting and you learn to subtract it out as an artifact you that's do. cool and you tend to I think the we tend to ignore the nail plate. I think it's just a natural thing that you just, you're like looking at the ma matrix yeah, and you're yeah, looking at the epithelium and you're like, hey, let me look cells. at that plate. I, wear patholo <laughs> I want to see cells there. <laughs> Not that it's am amorphous stuff, yeah. Right. Well, I think it was, you know, I heard you give a talk uh, several years ago when I was just, I think I was a fellow, and you were talking about the blood and how it didn't stain with him. And I was like, oh, there's hope for nails after all. <laughs> Beth Rubin is the hope for nail pathology. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to have a chance to interview you today. So thank you very much for doing this. That was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot for having me. <laughs>